we are now recording. Okay. And, I will, and you need so to make your font much you larger. Sorry? You need to make your font much larger. Okay. Okay, yes. All right. Uh, so Mark, I don't see the recording sign up. I'm not sure if it's being recorded. How's my. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, how's my font now? Uh, I can read it. A little bit bigger would be uh, easier. Uh, How about now? Uh, that looks pretty good. Uh, Kate, can you read it from there? Yes. Okay, we're, right. we're both good. All right, cool. So, a little bit of a background. Initially, I started writing a uh, engine that could run with ES Prima, Koja, and, and a bunch of other things, and try to write the rule there and parse the code there, but then I realized it's a little bit too much to crunch at first. So now what you're looking at is basically a set of tests that I wrote on an ESLint plugin. So I'm, I started working on an ESLint plugin, which has three rules so far. There's room for an, another one that I want to immediately work on, and there may be others. Um, so what you're seeing now is the test results ran on that plugin. Does it make sense so far? Um, these are these are the rules that I have defined. Uh, and I'll, let me share some text. Uh, okay. Let me just answer. Uh, Alex just asked. I thought we were starting at one. Um, uh, we're just we're 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 getting started with Dayon showing us his implementation of the purity checking rules. We're starting, we started early uh, because uh, Dayon has to leave soon. Uh, we are recording, so um, uh, you know, anybody joining on time or later will at least be able to refer to the recorded beginning. Okay, yes. Um, cool. So I want a little bit of an explanation. I wrote three rules, which are all packed in a plugin. There's room for more. I wrote tests. Luckily, ESLint, as you begin writing an ESLint plugin, it gives you the infrastructure to run tests and write the rule pretty easy. So I've defined some tests here. And what you see in the console is the execution of the test suite. Now, for each rule, there is a valid and an invalid case. OK. See the rule? There is a rule at the top. And then there's valid section and invalid section. Okay. And you'll see as I scroll up. So, so, a, so a green check mark means that something that should have been valid was in fact judged to be valid, and something that should have been invalid was in fact judged to be invalid. Yep. Correct. Correct. Okay. Great. Correct. So I started with some basic, some basic stuff at first. Uh, it was it was also my first time writing an ESL plugin, so I had a little bit of background, a uh, little, little bit of research to do. But no undeclared export means that whenever you're trying to export something that is not defined in the current module, such as you're trying to reference, you look at it invalid, you're trying to reference the window which, may, which is the global in, uh -huh. in the browser, for example, you're trying to export that, but also trying to export a property of a global is stopped. Also trying to export that in an object or an array, and no matter how much you nest the array, it will, it will catch it. Great. Um, this works OK for objects, defining literals. OK. So objects and um, arrays. Objects. objects and array, yes. OK. Um, there is, again, another kind of similar uh, case where you do export, no, import foo, and then let's say you export the same foo. So the module is acting as a proxy mm -hmm. between an, an import and an export. Right. And there is a pattern where I've documented this. Uh, this might not work for, uh, where is my doc? No, export, import it. Uh, if there is a pattern that I've seen in the wild where people gather 
something like this. They have a folder and then they have a bunch of JS files and then and an index file. And then they group all the files as the exports of, of this index in this index file. And then technically what that allows you to do is say import module from my package, module one from my package. Does it make sense what I'm explaining? Uh, I don't understand why it's invalid. Can you go back to the to the concrete case that was shown? Yeah, that, that, that case the right main, there. The main problem here is that um, since the linter runs per file, you don't yeah. know where the file that you are importing from is a pure method. No, no, the, but 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 the rules the the the, the rules we're trying to enforce um, is that under the assumption that uh, everything you're importing uh, has everything that you're importing is pure, and everything that you're exporting will be hardened. Uh, we're net, we're checking that everything you're exporting is therefore pure, but you're allowed to assume that everything you're importing is pure, because that's so, supposed to be in, enforced by the loader, um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, loading an allegedly pure module. It should only be able to import from 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 allegedly pure modules. So. Um... I want to let into the two uh, uh, observations you make. Yes, Carrie, this is per file. So there is no way to understand whether a file is coming, where it's coming from. I mean, there are ways actually right now, I've seen some linters being able to check uh, the dependency chain. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, second, I, 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 I would, yeah. I, I, uh, the rules I have in mind don't involve any multi-file checking. It is checking each file by itself, but it's assuming uh, a loader behavior um, uh, such that um, uh, everything exported gets hardened before it's provided to anything else as an import, and only things that satisfied our, che our static checking rules are candidates to be named as something to import from by anything else that's allegedly pure. Right, so then the linter would be able to check for whatever is that hardened, either key, it be the keyword, a function, or what, whatever you desire. If the linter detects that in the static analysis, then the rules will pass. Yeah. Yes, yes, but I didn't define that, that keyword. And so this would be as if somebody would deliberately skip the, the, the keyword, skip uh, defining something as being hardened. Uh, so I'm, I'm still, I'm still not, look, let's take a look at the, the line that the cursor is on. Yes. Now, it, uh, so, so first of all, I got to say, I don't remember the rules that Kate and I wrote down well enough to say what those rules should do here. So I'm just reasoning in terms of Sort of the intent, the intention I that I have in mind. Myself. I went to the same exercise myself. So, um, yes, it, yeah. So, so in terms of the intended meaning, the way I would reason is uh, import foo from foo uh, that we're assuming we're running under a loader, such that uh, uh, if we such that since we could import from something named foo, what we're importing from is pure, so the foo variable that we're getting is pure, okay. and then the export is the export is, is exporting to a loader which will harden the result, and now we're reasoning mm -hmm. statically about whether um, uh, curly bracket foo would be pure if hardened if foo were pure and the answer should be yes yes in that case yes i have not made the assumption that there is a loader in this rule okay if, if i make this that assumption then yes these 
all case all these cases should be valid. Okay, excellent. Okay, great. Um, now moving forward, the last one that I started working on uh, yesterday is about function, and he, here is something is doing. It's whenever you're exporting a function which has a closure over something that is internally defined in the module. Okay, let me interrupt you a moment because a bunch of new people have uh, just joined. Um, uh, we started early because Dayan has a lot to talk about with his static checking rules for purity and he has very limited time. Uh, we are recording, so everybody should be aware that we're recording. We recorded from the beginning, so everything that Dayan uh, explained before the meeting officially started will at least be visible in retrospect. Great, sounds good. Okay, go ahead. All right. Yes, so the last rule I was, uh, is no closure function. There is, I'm intending to write also a no closure class. Um, basically, this means that a function that is exported and has a closure over something that is defined internally in the module, if it's an object or an array or a, uh, a not, something that can be mutated cannot be uh, unless hardened. Good, good, good. So, that... so this is just return the return statement. There is there are considerations about param parameters which mm -hmm. I have not touched on. Yep. And there are, are considerations about what happens within the function body. Right now, I am able to check whether, and this was a little bit of a more extreme case. Uh, so we're defining a bar constant, which is an object. This object is being assigned to C, and then it is returned to C. Basically, I'm trying to somehow lose the track of bar. Right. Uh, and through static analysis, I am able to find out that bar, that actually C points to bar. Um, now, the same pattern can be applied to uh, um, parameters, function parameters. However, the function body uh, is a very difficult thing to understand. What we're asking from this linter is more like an AI uh, that tries to understand code. Right, we're, we're, uh, we're, we, we want to fail safe but with rules that are simple enough that we can explain what the rules are. So I think, I think uh, 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 these two lines being invalid is exactly what we want. Right. And then um, the class, of course, would have, um, if it's this, one of the properties under this uh, will be refer referencing something internal to the module, again, it cannot be considered here. Uh, could you write um, an example piece of code? Because I, I didn't follow that yes, verbally. Yes, 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 yes. Now, the class will be a little more complicated, I think. Yes, the class is a little more complicated. You, you, you might want to store state as in as an argument. And, uh, and also, the, even, even those functions there, you can call them with different contexts. On that side and find the use of this value is just no longer work. So this would be a oh. an example Good. which which is not is not is invalid. Good. Uh, very basic. Right? What what Kennedy was saying, something like this, uh something um what you were saying about state I'm saying that if you have a method on this on this uh, on this class that sets some internal state based on an argument that was passed into it, right? Like x, right. and then you and then you you store that x into uh, this the state or something like that. Um, so so you do something like this state equals argument. And, and remove the, remo uh, comment out line one, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, I So this should be valid. Um, this should. Yes. So, 
supposed to be valid, but then what happened when when you're exit when, when someone calls the bar with different contexts and such? Uh, it's okay that the class makes mutable instances. The class itself is pure. Yes, that's correct. Because there is no outside scope. Right. There's and there's no static state here. This is a very good example. I'll say this because uh, that, that, this will help you better define the class. Yeah. But if we have a weak map at the module level here, yes, for some internal things, just. Uh, right. If we use, if if we, we like to say that um, uh, private state uh, is we're using the weak map model of private state, um, uh, but if we actually write it using a weak map, we would have to do uh, um, much stranger analysis to make a purity judgment. The purity judgment would still be valid if we did the much more complicated analysis, but I'm not recommending it. Uh, since we are moving forward with the private state syntax, uh, let's go ahead and comment out line one. And on line four, say um, uh, pound state. And then on line 10, say this dot pound state. Even this, are you breaking up? Yep, yeah, yeah, this dot pound. This dot pound this. state. Ah, okay. okay. Okay, so that is the private state syntax that the committee is moving forward with. Mm -hmm. it, it is defined purposely to be equivalent to the weak map model of private state, uh, but uh, if written this way, uh, we should be able to have static checking rules that say this is valid if written in terms of how this would expand to a weak map, I, do, I, would, I would not expect our rules to be sophisticated enough to look at how the weak map is used and judge it to still be pure. That would be, it, it, you know, if it was, if it meant, you know, if it meant the equivalent thing, it actually would be pure, but the checking rules would be very much harder to explain. Yeah, that, 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 makes, that, that makes a lot of sense. That, that's a, another point that we can have for why this private state is it's a good thing. So can you go, Jan, can you go back to the example I want to ask a few more things about what we were talking last week. Um, okay. So J JF, you... JF joins since I made my last announcement. JF, we are recording. Um, we, uh, and we did record starting um, early, uh, so you'll be able to see the whole thing from the beginning later. Excellent, thanks. I will so have to leave in five minutes just to know Kennedy. Okay. It, it, can you add one more line after 10? <laughs> of course. Um, and do argument dot x equal one. That's one example. The other one is uh, imagine that argument is a function and then you call it. And uh, eight. so assuming that everything that you import is pure, you cannot assume that everything that, that, that is passed on to you is pure. So how does that work? Then? Okay, so this, so so we need to be careful about what we mean by pure. We're using the definition from Daria's thesis, um, uh, which is uh, somewhat different than the definition you'll see in some other programming language work. Um, the I would say this class is still pure. Pure does not mean that it can't create mutable objects. Pure does not mean that it cannot cause effects. It's Pure means that the object itself, from the object itself, there is no mutable state that's from the exported objects. There is no mutable state that is reachable. There is no ability to cause I.O. or to sense I.O. Um, that all ability to mutate is either by creating fresh state 
or according to stateful things that are passed in. Daria, do I have that approximately correct or correct enough? Yes, it is correct. Good. Okay, that helps a lot. Okay, okay so, um, so so I think the, the not, not for in for rule will, will control if we move that one or simplify it, but then the, the, the last, the, my last question is outside of that, um, of that class. On the, on the module body, if you're attempting to access something that is global, like Windows, um, what happened? And what if you try to mutate that thing that is global? Then, then you're not pure. Yes. Okay, so you're not pure. accessing. You're just accessing means you're not pure. Yes. If you're accessing, if you're accessing a free, a, a just in terms of speaking in terms of static analysis, if you're accessing a free variable, uh, then you're not pure. I'm sorry, if you're accessing a free variable that's not on the whitelist of safe globals, uh, and window is definitely not on that whitelist. So in the case of a work on one, for example, you, your class will be extending HTML element. Uh, and inside that, uh, you can access things. If you say HTML, if, you're, if you say HTML element as a, um, a free variable, you're not pure. The only things that are on the white list of free variables you can use are the uh, the the safe globals from ECMAScript itself, like object, array, math, JSON, um, and even math uh, is only math and date are only pure if you get rid of the ability to read the current time or or, or ask math.random. That, that may pose a problem though, because extending HTML element is how web components are being created. Yeah, those, and, and, and those, are, those will be resource modules. Those will not be pure modules. Anything that touches those things through free variables cannot be a pure module. Sorry, um, about HTML elements specifically, um, although it references HTML element, um, however, when you transfer a web component from one iframe to another through adoption, um, this, this reference to HTML elements is handled um, in a special way. Um, because it does not, it does not create a, a problem where your element is referencing a different HTML element than the one it is in right now. So, so there is a very, very special case in terms of HTML elements. I haven't read the specifics of it, but, um, but it, it, it really is a very, very special case that we should be aware of. Or yeah, it's com it's complex, be. yeah. That one is complex. Yeah. Uh, I would be, okay, so, so, I, so I'm open to investigating that. Um, uh, I, th this whole web components thing is not something I've paid enough attention to, but I would be very surprised if you could both reference HTML element and be pure. Uh, just from everything that I've ever experienced in the browser and DOM API, that would be very surprising. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree. I agree with you. In our case, we, we, we have a different abstraction that allows to be still pure, uh, but it, it, if you have HTML element, you, it's, you, you have access to Windows, basically. You have access to everything. Uh, and with something that cannot be linked with this dynamic, you can, you can access things out of the element that will give you access to the window. Yeah. So this, I mean, this is a great example of something where, uh, it, uh, because it's impure, uh, it can, you can write a resource module, and then the resource module would be loaded by a per compartment loader rather than a per root realm loader, and then different compartments can have different views into an underlying DOM tree. So they're, when they say HTML element, they can mean somewhat different things. I think that maps very well to what we have. I don't know if Jeff has a comment on this, but 
So it maps really well to what we have to do. Great. Yeah, and it, it would be piloting this approach uh, of multiple eval in a sense. Okay. So, Dayan, I just saw your comment. That Okay. Uh, 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 thank you, Dayan. He just dropped off. Um, uh, I got a lot out of that. Uh, so, uh, uh, to recap what all of that was about is uh, Kate and I tried to write down some static checking rules uh, for checking that a module could be judged pure uh, such that a module loader that wanted to only load pure modules could load modules that passed the check. And the rules um, is that uh, so if you're being loaded by that loader, then you can count on that loader only loading other things that are assumed to be pure. Uh, and you're also counting on the loader to call harden on everything that any module exports. So the static checking rules are basically checking that, that harden of the exports results in the exports being pure. And uh, this is probably a very nice opportunity to mention uh, on my screen, um, uh, I think I'm sharing my screen. Um, no. Am I sharing my screen? No. No, okay, hold on. Okay, there is this um, uh, new, there is this wonderful write-up from the Modable guys, the guys doing uh, embedded JavaScript, uh, where they've done this thing called preload um, uh, that, where they're explicitly um, uh, making comparisons between what they're doing and what we're doing. Uh, and I think there's, um, uh, and the, the basic idea here is that um, if you can do some initialization of an application in a way that does not depend on any outside state, and then once initialized, freeze everything so that there's no longer any mutable state. Basically, the, the state of the application or the state of some of the modules of the application after initialization are then made pure in Daria's sense, then that all of those modules can then be put into ROM and the execution at runtime in the device can then start from after that initialization. So I think this is a um, very nice um, uh, 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 very nice convergence of with the way we're planning to do uh, SES, where we can run shims that can customize an environment before we transitively freeze everything. Um, uh, it would mean that in an X, in a XS preload context. Uh, we would be doing that under the uh, further constraint that all of the customization had to be self-contained, could not depend on anything that was only available at runtime, uh, and that the result of freezing after customization uh, is that everything ends up being pure, um, uh, which, um, uh, and then, you know, with those two assumptions, then our notion of SES initialization, even with shimming, fits very well with their notion of preloading. Just to add, Mark, um, 
I worked on a compiler for the pliant language a long time ago. And essentially, we separated the metaprogramming and the, the host environments in different variables. So you could, you could say, I want to run a metaprogramming in the, in the host, sorry, in the compiler versus some staged object functions in the target. So you could refer to compiler functions and you could refer to compiler metas inside metas, but you could not refer to the target functions from inside those metas. Then we just froze it exactly the same way. We basically said all of our all of our uh, meta programming goes out the window when it comes to the actual runtime, unless you've created a meta that can run it out. Uh, and then we freeze the binary that way. We the functions we created with the meta programs can be written directly into the, the text section as opposed to data. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked into the details uh, yet. Uh, um, Got the link this morning, but it seems to be very similar to what Facebook and Sebastian was doing a lot of research on, on this area as well in the past to be able to execute some code and determine the mutation that this code is trying to do, and then uh, reducing that into a, an initialization piece of code that runs very quickly and does the, the changes that the more convoluted initialization process we're attempting to do with uh, um, accommodating all the memory allocation and such. It, it seems that it's related, but um, haven't seen too much progress on that project for a long time. So it would be interesting to see what Sebastian thinks about it. Yeah. So okay. so so that kind of stage separation is 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 very nice. Um, the additional thing with the modable that's that's different if i understand things from this other stage separation systems uh is that is the desire to take the preloaded state and put it into rom therefore requiring that the preloaded state be made pure before it becomes available at runtime Yes, that's, that is similar to the staging that I'm talking about in the sense that your meta program can generate as much state it wants to. And then when the host program refers to the generated state, it's gotten a frozen value essentially. Okay. What language is it you were referring to, Michael? Uh, it was one called Pliant. I don't know if it's around anymore. Pliant. Um, was that... Hubert Tonneau? So, say again? Hubert Tonneau? No, I don't know that name. Okay. Okay. What language tradition uh, is that language in, if that makes sense? Uh, it was his own invention for the, for the most part and uh, kind of came from uh, Pascal to an extent, but it had objects and everything. Everything came down to the the metaprogramming system that it had. Okay. So it had multiple syntaxes too. That's one of the things he did. My work, if it's still available in archive.org, would be under retargetable client cross compiler. Okay. Okay. Um, I do have a completely other thing to talk about, but let's first find out uh, if anybody else had something they wanted to talk about. I did want to talk about the state of Jessica at some point. Oh, I'd love that. Well, let, we can do that first. Okay. So, um, and we're still recording, by the way. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I made some progress with the peg tag, so I finally have extensible grammars working on, uh, on my side. The one thing that I'm missing that I think Quasi Parser Generator did better is the error reporting. And I intend to do that with uh, commits or cuts in the grammar to say when we actually have a grammar item that we don't want to backtrack over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other thing I'm working on is 
I'm using the TypeScript compiler to uh, generate the actual library files for Jesse and uh, for Jessica. I'm, I'm actually using the compiler API to detect the static analysis that we need to make. And uh, also, I can provide type files that are only for the Jesse, Jesse subset. So when you compile, it will give you type information and stuff for the Jesse subset you're using. But uh, if you go outside that subset, it will complain about that text. Uh, is there something useful you can put up on the screen to show us? Um, not quite yet. I'm, I'm, running, I'm basically going, trawling through Microsoft's source code for the, 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 the uh, type information and uh, uh, rewriting it a bit to have a lot more read-only fields rather than their mutable fields. So I, yeah, it's not really in a runnable state. I'll show it sometime other. Okay. I just wanted to see what others thought of the approach of using TypeScript as uh, input target for Jesse. I'm TypeScript is not a conformant subset of JavaScript. Um, so I am nervous about it, but that's a that's not a very informed opinion. Basically, it's a transpiler, and you can define compiler plugins that restrict the subset of, of input that it takes. So it essentially becomes type annotations that get stripped away when it transpiles. So, so go ahead, Salah. Uh, yeah, from personal experience, um, I used to write a lot of TypeScript, um, and when I discovered how much my code is different than what I thought, um, I stopped, really. Like, I, I, I didn't want to stop because it's very convenient. Uh, but, but I didn't stop um, and, and because TypeScript is not useful. TypeScript is very useful, but at that time, they were also introducing the idea of um, uh, JS doc um, annotation-based type checking. Um, and that idea has really evolved uh, that, that I don't need TypeScript, um, except if I really want to use some of the non-conforming features. Um, I find that um, type uh, definition files um, help, um, but all you need is really JS doc for most of your uh, type checking. Um, okay. if you, have, you know, like an interface that you want to define, uh, yeah, you can do that in, an, uh, in a, you know, secondary uh, type definition file. But as a compiler, um, it does change your um, classes, but obviously you can set the correct settings to prevent that from happening. Jesse doesn't have classes. Yeah. So, um, Generators can sometimes be, um, are, are they in play, you know? Uh, uh, Jesse does not have generators or async functions. Okay. So, so yeah, with, with a plugin, you can probably restrict these things, but I think um, with uh, TSLint, um, it could be sufficient to actually prevent those from being written. Now, the benefit, if there aren't, any classes, um, if the new constructor is not used. Well, yeah. We can talk about that too. So, so, so at this point, TypeScript, um, type checking with the JS doc annotations is all you need, really. Um, because um, if, if the new operator is, uh, is out of the picture, then you can't really have interfaces uh, based on classes. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think it's a little overkill to, um, you know, tame TypeScript compiler um, if you're not going to be using, um, you know, the, the harder to annotate types. Yeah, um, so what I'm learning so far is that, uh, and I wanted to get back to this more clear after a discussion of a couple weeks ago, um, I am beginning to prefer the make, reset, make, set, make promise functions 
For the simple reason that the news don't have an implicit hardening to them. Right. Good. Good. So the, the makes would basically just wrap a call to, the, the makes themselves would not be written in Jesse, would wrap a call to new and then return a harden of what the new returns. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, and at that point, we no longer need a new in Jesse, but it does mean that um, uh, SES API is exposed to Jesse uh, it's up to um, you know any SES programmer who wants to expose an API such that it's usable from Jesse has to do the work to do that, but that's not surprising. Yeah, and I'm thinking, I, I'm hoping to get these these primitives that we're discussing, like even blind when we get to it, into the SES shim at some point, at least so that the code will run. Mm hmm. Yeah, what is the status right now of uh, being able to run uh, Jesse through a uh, eval apply interpreter? Uh, I'm still getting there. Like, essentially, uh, what I want to work on first is the static analysis to get the code uh, to make sure I'm actually using the Jesse subset everywhere. Good. Uh, and then when I have that, I'll actually have. The, the grammars that I produce as something that I can interpret. Okay. Yeah, but it's still a while. It's it's a ways off. Okay. Um, on a completely different topic. Um, uh, the internals of, let's see, I should make my font. Can everybody read that font size or should I make it bigger? That seems to be good to me. Okay. So um, these are our magic, um, uh, you know, seven or so lines of code. Uh, looks like nine lines of code. Uh, but our, our magic lines of code that are the core of the realms shim, um, and you know it's really uh, you know rather extraordinary how how well this works, uh, except that the way in which we were invoking it, um, we were uh, invoking it. Um, uh, so okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I should I should stop and say um, I gave a presentation on this. Uh, uh, has does is everybody here familiar with the magic of these nine lines of code? Because if not, I can explain them and I should explain them. I think, and this is just my opinion, that it's self-explanatory, with the exception of the uh, line sixty. Okay, uh, so line sixty is actually the topic I wanted to talk about. So very good. Um, so, uh, so what uh, this is about? If we ignore line sixty. Uh, if we ignore line 60, then the rest of this is just literal. There's no substitution hole. So the unsafe function here, we could just replace all of this as just the body of uh, an anonymous function. Um, uh, so when the anonymous function is called, the um, uh, it's called with an argument, which is what's called the scope target. I'm sorry, it's called the scope proxy, and that's the thing that goes into here, the width, so that uh, everything else in here uh, executes within a scope that this proxy intercepts. Uh, actually, I think I see something wrong here. Line 63, argument 0, that's going to refer to the function on line 61, not 
line 58 or 59. There are different arguments zero. Exactly. That's intended. Okay. Um, uh, the reason we're using argument zero is we're being very, very careful not to introduce any names into scope because we're trying to use this as the sandboxing function so that we can evaluate code in a constructed scope of our choosing. So, um, so this is invoked, uh, so this is basically a function that is invoked with a proxy that returns a function that is invoked with a source string. So the argument sub zero passed to the eval over here is the source string. The, the really magical part here is that the eval, when looked up in the proxy, gives you the original unsafe eval, which means that this is a direct eval, which means that this source string is evaluated as if it were written literally inside this scope. Um, and therefore, all the free variable uses of that source string get looked up in this proxy. So that's ignoring the optimizer. The optimizer, um, uh, I think it's above here in the same file, build optimizer. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I, I <laughs> we should really record it. Because uh, I, I forgot all that. Um, yeah, if I if I recall correctly, um, uh, Kariti, you're the actual inventor of this yeah, magic I piece forgot. of code. <laughs> so that's why what I'm saying that we, we we choose recording so we don't we don't forget about these. Okay, I do have a YouTube record a YouTube presentation up. Uh, that is an extended discussion. Basically, it's a, I think it's like an hour and a half discussion of only these lines of code. All right, share that link with me. Okay. Um, um, uh, yeah, let me, let me actually find it. Hold on. So let me first of all introduce everyone to the wonderful playlist that I have. It was part of a discussion of the node security, presentation of node security, right? It was. Uh, that one was an abbreviated explanation. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll capture that one first. Um, the other one is a bit more uh, turbulent. Right. So, okay. So this one secure in the in the playlist that I just uh, pasted. Number twenty six is the presentation I made to Node Security that goes over those lines um, uh, uh, fairly quickly and not in depth because it's part of a much larger presentation. Um, uh, uh, playlist element number five: Report on Realms Shim Security Review. Oh, that turns out only to be thir uh, 37 minutes. I was wrong about the length. But that is, that is entirely about those magic lines of code. Um, for five or number 25? 25. 25. Uh, 25, Report on Realms Shim Security Review. This is a. Uh, we only cover the lookup. We don't co uh, cover the write aspect of it, which is uh, probably something we could detail up one day. Uh, I think that's correct. We also uh, do not cover the optimizer, uh, which is actually the thing I wanted to discuss because we had a very bad, an extremely bad performance bug um, that I think. You guys don't have, but you guys don't have, you, you know, in, in the Salesforce version of this, uh, but I think the reason you don't have it is because you hard-coded a special case. Yeah, what we do for the optimizer at Salesforce, and, and this, this code, the current optimizer, um, with some kind of auto-detection, 
uh, is something we wrote during the review. Uh, what we do is we take the list of um, identifier names from standard lib and uh, we add a few others like window and document and that's it. Okay. We don't uh, attempt to... Window and document? Correct. Window and document shouldn't be addressable through this mechanism. Yes, uh, but uh, I remember, our global is different. Our global is not uh, the real global. It's not uh, just a, a, a JavaScript global. It's, uh, it's the compartment-specific global object. Yeah, no, okay. Membrane for, for, for those two. Okay, right. Yeah. So it's still being extracted from the, the, the object passed as the global this. So there's nothing unsafe as far as that goes. Correct. The re and because because those are heavily referenced, uh, we do benefit uh, benefit from the uh, the optimization. Okay. So the reason we cannot do that uh, um, is that uh, the shims that SES defines uh, um, for uh, for uh, uh, must replace the global error uh, error constructor with a wrapper because of the way the v8 stack capture works and it must replace the global regex constructor with a wrapper uh, because of uh, on one of the browsers i think it's firefox uh, the uh, special static mutable uh, global communications channel things like dollar one are not deletable even though the the TC39 spec says that they must be deletable so the only way to hide them is to hide the constructor as a whole um, uh, uh, so in general uh, the ECMAScript spec says that a new realm is born with all of those things being mutable. Uh, therefore, um, uh, in order for the realm's shim to create a realm that is not gratuitously different than TC39 um, you know, ECMAScript as specified, uh, those things should still be assignable, uh, but the really motivating example for us is that for safety purposes, we actually need to replace them. Before yeah, this is where we made a we made a decision to um, have the TC39 um, specs, basically the uh, the base JavaScript language, as all identifiers are immutable uh, on on the window object. And the dumb API, uh, they are mutable because we don't optimize them except for window and, and document. So it gives a, gives the flexibility to people to load, say, a their own version of file API or whatnot, and override the one we provide. But they could not, for example, replace the error constructor or the correct, and they cannot replace promise and 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 what and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we so so obviously we also need, we also replace the date constructor because uh, the real date constructor gives you ambient access to sense sense the current time and therefore to measure duration. So we want to be able to replace all of those, and then we want to be able to freeze things, and then once we freeze things, we want the optimization. Yes, and and I think the uh, you know there's. Um, there are two things here. Is one is the optimizer could be detecting um, uh, identifiers that that could be malicious, um, and the, and the second is what you're mentioning about is the order of the operation. And I think you're more concerned about the order of the operation, right? Yeah, there's there's a there's very much an order of operation issue in trying to get both the efficiency and the correctness, where the correctness criteria is that a variable isn't optimized 
until the corresponding global property is made into a unwritable, unconfigurable data property. Uh, because, now, at, because at that point, you're guaranteed that its value is stable. So at that point, you can, uh, you can do this optimization without the optimization creating an observable incorrectness. There's a, um, we know there's a sh limitation in, uh, in the, uh, in the shim, which is the fact that, uh, global, um, are not preserved between invocations. So, uh, a declaration of a function will not be preserved because we create a contour on every, um, on every invocation of our eval. Um, would it be possible to, um, or, or would it be conceivable to have a, a regeneration of the inner working uh -huh. of eval after freezing and, and, and then the optimizer could uh, come into play? That's what I'm about to show you. Okay. <laughs> But warning, we'll at that. warning, we'll at that Bri Bri Brian and I just looked at, uh, so let me, let me paste the, pa the, the URL of the page I'm looking at. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I'd love to have a discussion also uh, about if there's anything we, I, I know some of the things we discussed in the past, but I'd love to maybe explore if there's anything that has changed regarding this problem with preservation, preserving um, uh, the contour. Yeah. So it turns out that Actually, Mark, let me have you use this other URL instead. I have a cleaned up version of your patch there. Oh, excellent. Excellent. I just moved it up to current trunk. Okay, very nice. So maybe I can rephrase or characterize a problem and you correct me if, if my simplification is is uh, is incorrect um, in your case which is different than ours you won't have the capacity to execute code in the com in the compartment before freezing and then invoke freezing and then continue correct so it's uh, sort of. Uh, the thing that's impossible with the technology that we're looking at, and impossible with any technology that I know how to how to, uh, you know, uh, pervert JavaScript into, uh, is to have some th code that is already evaluated continue execution. Now with new optimizations, I don't think I don't think that's going to be possible. But that doesn't correspond to what we actually need for SES. What we actually need for SES is that uh, we create a compartment, we create, you know, the, the, the compartment, you know, the compartment in which, you know, basically we create the root realm, which, which has all the compartment logic in it as well. Um, we evaluate the shims in there. Uh, we do that while everything is mutable. Then, once all the shims are evaluated, um, then we freeze all the globals, all the primordials, and then once we only once we do that, do we then evaluate untrusted code. Now, when the untrusted code invokes functions that were installed by the shims, those functions were the result of evaluation prior to optimizability, and therefore they will, those functions internally will still pay the performance cost. But that's a, that, that I do not expect to be a significant issue. Um, all of the untrusted code that's loaded after freezing, um, it's loaded by a, an eval that happens after the freezing, and therefore that eval can benefit by optimizing all the frozen global variables. 
not getting this. I'm missing something. Uh, uh, should I try again, or or should you ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Try, try again. Try again. See okay. Okay. Um, uh, let's let's contrast two cases. Um, I eval the string object. Um, uh, then I uh, eval this. Uh, let's look, sorry. Let, let's start off. I eval the string uh, object equals three. Then I eval the string. Um, uh, 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 reflect dot define property of of uh, this comma quote object comma writable writable colon false configurable colon false. In other words, I freeze the property, and then after having evaluated the string that causes the property to be frozen. I then do another fresh eval by calling the eval function um, uh, on the, just the string object. Now, the, the, uh, uh, what I claim we want to happen is what would happen according to the ECMAScript spec, which is the assignment to the global variable object succeeds changing the value of object, the define property then takes the, uh, the property named object on the global this object and turns it into a non-writable, non-configurable data property, which is now guaranteed to have a static value. And then we do a fresh eval of the string object, which now, rather than faulting through the proxy mechanism to look up the binding of object, um, uh, ends up uh, uh, obtaining the value of object from the lexical variable binding created by the optimizer. So, so let me explain for everybody the optimizer because we didn't actually walk through what build optimizer does. So build optimizer is given this list of constants, uh, which in the scenario I'm talking about would include the, the name object. So it's a list of constant names. Uh, if the list of constant names is empty, then it just returns the empty string. So then that gets plugged in here at the bottom on line 61 uh, as just you know as just nothing so it's as if as if there is no optimizer if there are constants here um, uh, such as the name object and let's also say the other things that will typically be there uh, in a con when when uh, emulating uh, the JavaScript standard would be nan undefined and infinity uh, because in uh, the JavaScript standard, those are also defined as non-configurable, non, non those are the only things defined as non-configurable, non-writable data properties on the initial state of the global object. So let's say the constants includes those four values. Then um, you get the string const open curly, and then those four names separated by commas, close curly equals this. So that string gets returned. That gets plugged in on line 61. So let's go back to line 61. So on line 61, um, uh, what gets plugged in on line 61 is referring to this. So I didn't, I didn't explain this previously. Um, the this, um, uh, the outer function is invoked essentially with two arguments. It's invoked with a this binding, and it's invoked with an argument sub zero. The argument sub zero is the proxy we've already discussed. The 
um, this binding is the safe global um, uh, from which the constant bindings should be extracted by that optimizer string. And they're extracted purely by um, the optimizer string is using the new JavaScript pattern matching syntax to extract all those from the safe global by pattern matching. Um, the inner function, uh, the argument is also invoked with effectively two arguments. The argument sub zero is the source string and the this binding of the inner function is the uh, the global this object is the object that the evaluated code should perceive to be the global object. And those are not necessarily the same, but it's it, it, but for purposes right now, we don't need to worry about the difference. We're just uh, did it this way so that we have the flexibility of those two things being different. Yeah, well, I, I, I remember this. I remember. I remember these, this P, I think, or the things that we talked about in the past were, well, can we create a, when there is a mutation that is affecting the optimizer, can we just simply regenerate the function? I would say no, because whatever you already evaluate, it's pointing to those. That's right. Um, those, those, those things that are, that were optimized in previous incarnations of it. Right. Uh, so I, I, I remember these. Um, I don't remember if we ever looked into first detecting that there is a mutation that is important to us and then trying to carry on that mutation in, the, in, in this particular scope. I, I, I didn't think about that as a potential solution. But uh, I haven't think about what kind of workaround. There might be some tricks that we could do, but I don't know. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so I'm I'm showing you the workaround that we've come up with. But let me let me, uh, let me um, uh, extend the previous example to explain the limit on it. Let's say that the first eval that we did before object was constant um, uh, was we defined a function. Uh, where the function, um, uh, uh, the body of the function was return object. Uh, and then we, then we lock down um, uh, object. Then we do a fresh eval of something else. But in that new eval, we take the function we've already created from the old eval, and the new eval evaluates code that, call, that calls the old function. The old function is not optimizable because it was created by evaluating with this direct eval inside a constructed function whose optimizer did not include object. So even after object gets locked down, functions created by old evaluations remain slow, which I think practically does not matter. But anything that's the result of a new evaluation after things are locked down does get all the benefits of the speed up. And I think practically that's really the only thing that's going to matter. Because that will include all module loading that happens after we lock things down. Okay. So the code on the left was the code that um, uh, uh, whose optimizer failed to optimize for us. And the reason is that um, we create the uh, this this function on line 70 create safe evaluator factory um, uh, is given a safe global and then on line 74 it figures out it looks at the safe global to figure out what the constants are uses that um, to make a 
a scoped evaluator factory, which it uses to make a scoped evaluator, which finally uh, down below here um, is used inside the eval function. Um, uh, the eval fun the safe eval function, which actually gets bound to eval in the user's namespace, the scoped evaluator is applied to the safe global and the source. Um, uh, so that's the inner application. Uh, of, and the outer application is over here. The scoped evaluator factory is the outer function that gets applied to the safe global and the proxy. Um, uh, so the reason why we were failing to evaluate is we're making this evaluator factory thing early before anything was locked down and then we kept using it after things were locked down so even new evaluations that happened after things were locked down were using an evaluator factory that had been created before things were locked down. Uh, and therefore, uh, we were not benefiting from the optimization at all. And in particular, um, uh, one of our most important current customers, which is MetaMask, uh, who's doing uh, Cessify, that by the way, I'm going to ask him to come to one of these meetings and prevent, present Cessify which is a Cessified ses version of Browserify. MetaMask is a browser interface to Ethereum that's currently using Browserify to handle modules, and he's turning that into Cessify. Um, and it's working, but because of exactly this issue, he's experiencing a massive slowdown. Okay. So... All the code in red on the left pane in here, I basically took all of that code and moved it into the green on the right inside our safe evaluator. But I do it um, uh, 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 in a lazy manner. Um, so there is a scoped evaluator memo that... Um, uh, that if the memo is empty, then I create the scoped evaluator at that time um, uh, and then use it. Um, uh, and then if the, um, if the scoped, I'm sorry, if the scoped evaluator is not empty, then I simply, um, then this scoped evaluator, then, you know, then I basically over here on line 84, I read the memo. On line 86, I check if I found a scoped evaluator that was memoized. And if so, then we fall down below the entire green box and then just use that scoped evaluator here on line 113. Um, uh, so the entire issue here is the managing of memoizing a scoped evaluator and when we invalidate that cache. So the first thing I, we do here is um, if the scoped evaluator that we get, if the memo is empty, then we do here inside the green from lines 87 through 100, uh, we do essentially what we were doing in the red uh, lines of code on the left but we're just postponing it till then. Uh, then what we do is, because of the way the internal initialization logic of the Realm Shim works, is we actually do some evaluations before we populate the safe global at all, just internally as part of our own initialization logic, um, uh, in order to create some of the things that we use to populate for the initial populating of the safe globals. So if so in that case, for those internal early evaluations, there will be no constants. So for that one, we don't we don't memoize. So we don't memoize at all 
until we have some constants. Uh, once we have uh, constant, once once we have some constants, we'll go ahead and memoize. Um, but notice that we're asking the scope handler to do the memoizing. What is the scope handler? The scope handler is created all the way out here on line 73, which is unmodified. So there's one handler created um, uh, for the entire scoped safe evaluator factory that gets reused on every evaluation um, uh, as long as it's for the same safe global. Um, so we're store so for each handler we're going to store the memo. The handler is used down here on line 99 to create a scope proxy um, uh, per um, uh, um, uh, basically, for, for different endowments, we need different scope targets, which means we need different scope proxies, but we're reusing the, the handler, and therefore we're reusing the, um, uh, the, memo, the, the memo on a per handler basis. And that, so that gives us some hope of not having to regenerate it more often than we need to. Now let's go to scope handler. Uh, so in scope handler, um, we add this um, uh, new uh, state variable, scoped evaluator memo, and a new getter function and setter function. And in retrospect, I have to say that I, that I made this more complicated than I needed to. Uh, I might as well just expose this as a public property, uh, having it be a um, lexical variable that's exposed with the getter and setter is, is not doing anyone any good. Um, but that's the way it's coded right now. Um, Here's the key thing, which is the get trap of the handler is invoked when a property lookup, a ver I'm sorry, when a, when a free variable lookup has bypassed the optimizer, is looking up a variable that's not defined by the optimizer, um, and, uh, and therefore faults onto the proxy. So prop is the name of that variable. If prop is in the target, uh, um, then line 88, which is, the, which is uh, the same as it used to be, it's neither green nor red, uh, then we just return target sub prop. So that, so that code is unchanged. The additional code here is, well, since we're on the slow path anyway, Let's go ahead and check whether uh, this property on the safe global is now a non-writable, non-configurable data property. And if so, we just do a cache invalidation. And having done the cache invalidation, the next time we, invalid, we eval do an evaluation, we'll regenerate the scoped evaluator with a fresh optimizer that will include um, at least this new non-writable, non-configurable data property, as well as anything else that has gotten locked down in the meantime. So uh, the, uh, uh, you guys measure this? Because this, it feels to me that it will be a slower. So there are many things that will not be cacheable and you have to pay the penalty at the time. Uh, on the other hand, we could think about what kind of operations you need to do or you can do to make one of these things uh, not writable, not configurable, and then tap into those to invalidate the cache when that operation happens. Which yeah. We know is a, is a unique domain of things. So Oh, write it down because this 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 getter trap is heavily used or should be heavily used for things that are not optimized. Okay, so I agree. 
So I have a proposal to make, which is part of the reason we did it this way is to avoid changing the Realm Shim API because the Realm Shim API is supposed to be a shim of what we want to propose. Um, uh, and right now we're, we sort of have this um, uh, uh, sense of where the boundary is between Realm and Cess. Uh, if we moved the um, hardened primordials into the Realm shim, so that Cess, once it was ready to harden the primordials, could just call hardened primordials on the realm shim, then that would be a perfect time to do the cache invalidation. And then we wouldn't need the get trap at all. I'm well, able to get, don't, don't get the part where the, 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 the code uh, evaluation, I don't know the name, but used by the, the new generated hash is injected into this code. That that part is still possible how that, that happens today. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. So up here you invalidate that thing. Yes. Eventually you try to evaluate something else. Right. And when, when you try to evaluate something else, you uh, are you generating a new evaluator? With That's a right. New hash? That's right, and, oh, yeah. then, and then we memoize it. Yeah, the new evaluator include you know uses a proxy. The proxy has a target. The target has um, the endowments. The scope handler is the thing um, that that needs to know about these optimizations. Yeah, basically on line um, I, I scrolled up back to the previous uh, file on line eighty four uh, is where we then read the memo that we have now invalidated. Scoped evaluator will then be undefined so that this if test succeeds and then we go through all of this logic again uh, to create a new scoped evaluator which we memoize. And we do that on a per handler basis. Okay, so I have... Uh, okay, so you are, you are only optimizing when you're certain that that thing will never change in the future. That's right. That's right. And, and so that's, that's why throwing that away doesn't matter because any previous evaluation is still pointing to things that will not be able to change in the new generated e file. That's right. All the old evaluations are still valid. Uh, it's, it's, it's just that they're slower because they were evaluated under weaker assumptions, but everything they're doing is correct. We, we should mention there's one incorrectness in this particular patch yes. where the endowments that are, are passed in are captured in the cached uh, scoped evaluator, even though they shouldn't be. This could be called again later with a different set of endowments, and this will cache the wrong ones. Mm -hmm. So we still have to work on fixing that. Yes, that is that is currently uh, incorrect. and, and But um, so we definitely need to address that. But, but let me, returning to uh, Karidi's point about adding adding an expensive test in the get trap, all we need is some kind of signal to tell the realm shim, now's a good time to, evaluate, to, to invalidate those caches. And as long as we have some signal, then we can invalidate the cache and then recreate them on demand and everything's happy. There's a... Uh... If, if you go back to the get uh, change, the detection there does it does a one extra thing, right? Which means even if uh, you know any new global that's created as non-configurable and non-writable at any point in time mm -hmm. will allow this uh, regeneration. That's right. right. That's exactly right. Which so, is slightly different than having that one signal at freeze time. Can you say that again? I didn't get that. Mm, mm. Mm, right? That's correct. So, um, so th this does something 
different than having a, a signal that says, I'm going to freeze, now invalidate your current evaluator. Um, this actually will regenerate every time we have a, 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 a new value that's global and uh, that is un, uh, not writable, not configurable. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, the example you were just saying, uh, done in proper SES, is a perfect, a perfect example, which is, let's say you're using SES um, in order to um, create a something like um, a um, confined browser frame, yeah. i.e., like Kaha and like what's, what what you guys described, where you where each compartment after initialization is also the global of the uh, you know you create a new compartment you populate its global with a window and a document that was created to be safe, you populate it after the compartment was created. Uh, and then let's say that because, um, as you found, you'd like to optimize them, uh, you go ahead uh, in your SES initialization code uh, of, going, of locking them down, you're locking them down after the initial signal, and you'd still like them to be um, optimized. So that, that's, that's a very good example. Now, there's a, a potential, um, uh, maybe, um, things to, to watch here. Um, the global can be accessed without uh, a direct lookup. Uh, using a lookup via this or via uh, window dot something or, or the global dot something mm -hmm. which will trigger this get trap and bypass the current optimizer because this no it, it will not trigger the get trap because the the proxy is the scope target of the width it is not the global this object Okay. Okay. Right. So uh, line ninety. Okay, got it. What one question about line ninety? Okay. Uh, why are you getting the prototype of the target? Oh, the reason. So there's there's actually a comment elsewhere in the code that applies uh, there and here, which is the target is. Um, uh, it, um, inherits from the safe global, the target is the thing that the proxy uses as the proxy target. So its purpose is to hold the endowments, which are the emulation of the global lexical scope, the global contour. Uh, it inherits from the safe global. Over here, we want to look only at the safe global. The safe global is per hand, you know, okay is sta stable anyway, what we should have done is when we create the handler, we should pass the safe global in as a parameter for creating the handler and the handler should just remember the safe global directly as a state variable. Oh, and then there's a, a, a necessary implementation limitation, um, uh, which we uh, there's a to-do in the code to check for, which is if an endowment shadows a global, uh, this code will go crazy, or this code will do the wrong thing. Is the anything that gets optimized will shadow the endowments because it shadows the proxy, um, and, but the things which are optimized come from the safe global, which should be shadowable by the endowments. So I think the right thing for the shim to do is a, you know, a shim, it's, I think it's valid for the purpose of a shim to say, this particular part of the specified behavior, I just can't implement. You know, throw an error that says, uh, this is an implementation limitation of the shim. And we do that elsewhere. Um, and so I think that the endowments 
Uh, we simply have to enforce the rule that they cannot conflict with any of the global variables. Yeah, I think I think we're not actually scanning the endowments right now. So that uh, a bug in our current shim is that if the optimizer were working, if it was actually optimizing the globals, then we would have the shadowing problem. Because line 88 is checking to see if the property is in the target. That's either going to be in the endowments or in the the global in the um, globals. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark, do we have somewhere written down the, the list of APIs that will allow you to, that, that, that could be used to detect the signal, but something is changing that you should invalidate? Uh, object undefined, uh, object freeze, object. Oh, use. oh. So you're basically, you're, uh, you're thinking of, of that. you're thinking of basically, Replacing all of those with wrappers that also generate the signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did something very much like that in in the old Kaha days. Uh, it was unpleasant, but it did work. Um, the question is, can we still intercept all of them? Are there any internal calls inside the spec to object.freeze, because if there's an internal call from another internal function in the spec, it might be non-interceptable. You mean just something that sets the integrity value somehow? Yeah. Uh, they do it on creation of intrinsics, but I don't know of any runtime API that does it. Okay. And, li and likewise, that will lock down an individual property, turn a property that did not used to be a non-writable, non-configurable data property and turn it into a non-writable, non-configurable data property. And even as I'm saying this, the idea that that might happen internal to the spec seems incredibly unlikely. Yeah. So... I think you're probably right. I think I think if you replaced all of those things with safe wrappers that also invalidated the cache, that that might work. We could probably just uh, wrap the global with a, a proxy that would detect those changes, right? Um, then. The global object itself is a proxy, so all of uh -huh. the direct accesses that you make to the to the global as an object, so you know window dot document, um, those would now all become proxy traps rather than direct property accesses. Uh -huh. So now the question is, um, I mean, you know, that can still all be correct, but are you willing to? move the performance burden over there. Have every property access on the global object that's explicitly a property access, not a variable lookup, um, uh, fault on the proxy. Well, there's a, um, there's a, uh, the issue is that for the DOM API, uh, freezing the DOM API is, uh, is uh, is a much larger larger undertaking uh, than uh, just the base JavaScript API. I think we're talking about the diff uh, five milliseconds versus twenty milliseconds. Five milliseconds, people don't notice it on startup. Twenty, they start uh, uh, noticing. At least the developers, and because there's a lot they can do in these in that yeah, little bit of time. So we can we can do it nicely via the proxy. So exactly. In the getter itself, we, we determine okay, this is coming from this is in this pocket, and if it is in this pocket, we do it nicely. Exactly. Um, so, but it, it was when you still need to wrap the global versus uh, with a some type of uh, something that will be that will detect access. Okay. So and, yeah, if we, and if, if not all access are made through uh, the with statement. There's the this and, and what and the direct window dot something. Then 
uh, we need uh, that global object uh, wrapper, I think. So that would work. Um, and I do, I do not have a sense of the performance cost. Part of the reason that I don't have a sense of the performance cost and why I would, for my purposes, be perfectly fine doing it this way is I try to stay clear of using the global object as an object whenever possible anyway. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And then we don't have to wrap the, you know, object.freeze and reflect.freeze and all that. We just have, we just do all the logic in the trap handlers for that proxy. Correct, which is the approach we've been taking uh, internally. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I just still think that this, this is going to be considerable slower. Uh, once you tried it, you, you mentioned that there, there was someone already having issues, performance issues uh, with the cache. The performance uh, issues yeah. were that every time they looked up object or array or math or JSON, they were going through the proxy every single time. Yeah, but then now, now the flip side is that when they access something else, right, if they don't have anything on global, it's fine, yeah. For us, it's just... Uh... Yeah, and, and that, that's when where you, you come with another trick, which have, we have discussed in the past, which is, um, I, I, I think we still need to look at it, and it might be viable um, if we consider that the global object is, um, for, I mean, most cases, it's not going to be uh, uh, destroyed uh, without some attention. Um, the idea is to put the proxy of the global on the parent of a plain object, mm -hmm. and on accessing properties, you define, you redefine those properties on the front object. So, so therefore, you never go through the lookup once they have been accessed and, and deep immutable. I oh. think I have such a proxy already um, implemented um, exactly with, with the same idea that uh, you, you change the behavior of the global object, um, but you also cache whatever uh, reference entity. Um, so I create a proxy for every um, function that, that is being uh, that is being accessed off the of global, and I keep that proxy um, stored so that subsequent calls to the same function um, would be handled by the same proxy. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you're going for? Um, it sounds different, but interesting. So let me try out an attack and see if either of your schemes are vulnerable to it. Let's say that the, the, the untrusted code being evaluated gets its global this object and then does a uh, object.define property of some property on the this object. Because they're doing a defined property, um, and the, the, the object itself is a plain object, it just inherits from the proxy, um, the defined property will define an own property on the this object, which will prevent any faulting of that name onto the proxy. I really have not uh, designed it for this particular case. <laughs> So it, it was more generally, I was trying to shim the um, uh, module namespace um, global um, um, references. So um, I, I pasted the source there and uh, a demo that shows the behavior, um, which I could share my screen just to explain because you know it's like simple logs really. Okay. So yeah, uh, please do. Yeah, um, let me share my screen. So 
Uh, it's one of those windows. Yeah, so uh, I'll just run through the code. Um, it basically uh, takes a scope, which is uh, one level removed from, um, no, actually scope here is, a, is an object that has um, overloads uh, for the globals that it wants to overload. Um, and if it's um, part of the globals, it just returns that. Um, like the overloading globals, the scope ones. Um, and uh, yeah, my code is actually uh, like halfway edited, so there are bugs here. But if it's a function from the actual global scope, it um, keeps in the locals um, a refer like a, a, a cache of the proxies created for those functions. Um, here, the naive assumption is that, like, um, you're basically all your functions are like global functions, like part of the built-ins that are put on window, for instance. Um, so it's not really meant to be like a robust um, okay. um, proxying mechanism at this point. Okay. Um, but it creates that proxy for 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 that uh, property that was called on the getter. Um, and then, you know, the setter basically says reference error because in module namespaces, um, if you're deferring to the, the proxy of the global, that means it's outside the scope of the module namespace, so it should be a reference error. Um, yeah. And um, it basically behaves that um, if you call something that is undefined, it hits that proxy, it's undefined. Um, if you call object, um, here, that proxy, which which proxies object can can do whatever um, uh, um, um, you know um, behaviors you want to attribute to that, like the emulation of a freeze here. Uh, but here it says you can't really um, assign to object because it's not defined. But you could create a new object, and that's the behavior of a module namespace. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, I, 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 my apologies, but I think I'm arriving at one of those psychological states that feels like my brain is full. Um, um, I, I just, I did not absorb that as well as I should have. Um, yeah, well, it, it's 50% me, right? Because um, I, I, I hardly uh, put things in a very absorbable, uh, you know. Um, okay, so, so when I have a module, uh, being um, simulated, um, I have a similar um, um, like a like a like an eval with function wrapping, and um, the with takes module scope. Okay. Uh, module scope is a proxy made on a on an object with some overloads of of the global window in this case. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to over, uh, overload one or two of the properties with, with you know, actual things. But I also want to make sure that every time I call a function uh, against this proxy, uh, like if I'm calling a property like object, um, then I want to also make sure that I always return um, a proxy of object that gives me a different behavior um, then uh, calling object uh, outside of a module namespace, like a simulated module namespace. So the getter, um, if, it, if it's one of those uh, overloads, it just returns. Okay, it. okay. If it's a function, um, then it does additional work. It either has it cached in the locals um, or if it's not cached in the locals, it creates a new proxy for that particular function and keeps it in the local. Um, so the, the function proxy here handles construct and apply so that you don't get like um, uh, calls to um, add listener or like all these dumb errors that you get if you use proxies. Um, I basically uh, alleviate this here. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I also make sure that if you're setting, that means that you are assigning to a variable oh. that is not declared within the encapsulated um, um, function. Okay. Uh, so if it escapes and it hits the proxy, it should the reference error. Um, and that's just part of the behavior of a multi-link space. Okay. Um, so basically, yeah. it's, it's emulating a non-extensible global object. Yes, where where you can reference the object in a get um, um, fashion, but you can't really set to it because there's no variable in this code. Um, so so here I'm just emulating as if it's undefined. Okay. Yeah. So so here I have some just a bunch of tests that I execute within this. Um, um, within a, a module namespace, a simulated mm -hmm. module namespace, mm -hmm. and an undefined variable, which really isn't defined in this scope, uh, returns the correct error, um, trying to set it, right? Um, and if you try to do, to set object, you get the same error, um, but still, you could refer to object and construct an object um, both, you know, all of which go through that proxy that can be tailored to modify the behavior of object um, within that um, namespace encapsulation. Cool. Um, I think I got a lot out of that. Um, uh, one thing uh, that's that's really just a side note, but something to caution you about, is uh, the bizarre semantics of type of. Um, uh, you you can do type of any expression, so and so in that sense, type of just seems to be a unary operator that evalu mm -hmm. that evaluates the expression to a value, and then examines the value. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you say type of an undefined variable, what the the semantics that um, in a sane language um, would have done, given the rest of the language, you know, the con the consistent answer would be that you evaluate an undefined variable, which is the operand, uh, that throws a reference error, and then you never type of because a reference error was thrown instead. It's not what JavaScript does. Mm -hmm. uh, type of an undefined variable returns, yeah. returns the string undefined, yeah. and we found no way when we were constructing the realm shim, when uh, JF and Brian and Dean and I all spent a week together in a room doing the security review and experimenting, we found just no way for the proxy to distinguish a variable lookup that was inside a type of from a variable lookup that was not inside a type of. So, so therefore, you, we either had to have a, a, the lookup of, of the variable sometimes return undefined or we had to have type of undefined variable uh, throw a reference error. There was just there was there was no way to be correct on that. Um, yeah. So so that that's a so so here we're talking really about how do you preserve the behavior of type of against a backing proxy context. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I never went that far. Uh, yeah. the, the only thing that came to mind is that at some point I wanted to look at uh, module namespace um, uh, where a particular binding is uninitialized. And I just got that by making sure that the lookup object does not have that field until it's first initialized. That's the only way I could really um, preserve that behavior. Uh, but here, reference error. Um, only simulates when you set. Right. So, so I, I avoid uh, touching errors as much as I can with any proxy. 
So, so, but, but that's the only area that you cannot really, um, you know, have um, occur in, in some fashion um, without, you know, instrumenting code to actually do it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but, but that's a very, very interesting, um, okay, now, now I'm going to waste tomorrow trying to, <laughs> trying to get that behavior uh, if I find a good scenario for it. Nice. So this this is still using eval. So you're under the script goal on what you're. Yeah. Using? Okay. Uh, um, actually, no. Like I, uh, I I I eval the evaluator under the script goal, uh, or by you know just using the um, argumented eval, like one comma eval, and then I create one evaluator. Um, and, uh, but I actually bundled it, like I write this as modules, like all, all these files are written as modules and I bundle them as both ESM and uh, um, just um, IPI, I guess, is the other format I use here. So my question there was around, there are some parser differences between mm -hmm. script and module that eval, if anything goes through eval, uh, wouldn't uh, right. be able to emulate. That's right. Eval eval does not understand modules. Period. Yeah, yeah. So, so I have a trick that I do that I uh, I basically use um, uh, tag templates to escape. Uh, sorry, uh, template literals or you know uh, whatever they call them now to escape all my imports and exports, and I convert those to. Um, Helper functions, basically, function calls. So mine was more concerned about assignments uh, to arguments, eval, HTML comments, and like the other esoteric parts and differences. Yeah, yeah, no, like I, I haven't gone that far. This was really just um, conceptual uh, design to see, to see if the behavior okay. of name can can be, um, you know. Um, Polyfilled for um, like I was really upset that workers still don't support modules, and I was seeing if there was a, a neat way to do it. Yeah. Workers do not support modules. That's the current status. Just Chrome does, and I think it's flagged. Um, Safari imports, but only scripts, okay. and dynamic imports only. Uh, Firefox, I haven't been up to date. Uh, okay. They're still working on dynamic imports, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, they finished dynamic imports like last week. All right. Yeah, I, I, I think it rolled. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, I've been using it flat, so it's been okay. All right. So I guess that's, that's my bit. I hope this helped. Uh, like, I'm I'm not distracting everyone away from that. So this was this was useful to look at. Yes. All right. Great. If we have time, do we want to talk about the JS Foundation? Oh, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I think now is a a good break point on that topic. Uh, uh, Kate proposes we talk about JS Foundation. Sounds like a good idea to me. Okay. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we had the call with Dory from the JS Foundation. Um, can everyone hear me from Mark's computer? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so we had that meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, the recording is up right now um, on SoundCloud. Um, we'll try to put it into the, the list of the YouTube videos, but there's no um, there's no visual, so we have to kind of modify that a bit. But um, the takeaway was, uh, it sounds like we can go ahead and start applying. Um, we just need to show that we're seriously uh, working on things like having um, governance documents, uh, contribution documents, things like that. Um, and so I guess the question is, um, of uh, the people who are major stakeholders in CES and you know, have an interest in it, are we interested in moving forward? And then if so, how do we want to define um, our governance? Um, it sounds like we need at least three companies 
um, the stakeholders have to be from at least three companies so that uh, there is a balance of power. Okay, well, uh, Gorik volunteers to be one of those three. Oh, yeah, and we, we will be, obviously. Okay, so Salesforce. Okay. I can ask GoDaddy. I okay. do not have the power to commit. Okay, so possibly GoDaddy. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, and I would expect that uh, the modelable guys would agree very eagerly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that sounds great. Okay. Um, let's see. What would be the best forum for uh, doing kind of a group write-up of what the governance would be? Um, so, so presumably, if the JS Foundation has lots of other groups like us, mm -hmm. that there are some, you know, sort of stock off-the-shelf choices to to start with. Uh, and then uh, we could, um, then, you know, s starting with one of those, then adjust only as uh, we feel the need for adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, Jory sent me some of those. Um, I think I got one of them. One of them was like the ESLint uh, governance, which seemed really good. Um, I forget what the others were. I guess I was asking more. Um, uh, what venue can I send that out on, in oh. which um, you know everyone who's interested in participating would be able to participate? Uh, um, I would say the uh, SES strategy uh, Google group. Okay. Does that sound reasonable to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I agree with Mark also the content of the document. It's a lot easier to have alignment if we follow some some other pattern. That right. people already expect or are familiar with. Right, right. Just a heads up, uh, I probably will not be super responsive for the next couple months, but so don't wait on me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I'll, I will try, now that we have everyone kind of in agreement that that's where we want to go, um, I will try to send something out on Zest Strategy so we can get that started. Great. Cool. Um, uh, let's see, one final topic um, uh, is uh, uh, Peter Hadi of Modable uh, is going to be attending TC53, I think is the, if I'm remembering the name correctly, which is the new uh, ECMA technical group for IoT. Uh, and he asked me to present on uh, JavaScript subsets uh, with an eye towards uh, the alignment between the kinds of reduction in runtime burden that helps security and the alignment on runtime burden that helps IoT. Uh, so both, you know, the CES with the deep frozen primordials and what we've discussed with regard to uh, preload, uh, but also um, uh, Jesse. Um, uh, Model guys are very interested in Jesse. If Jesse turns out to be practical, uh, it can be, you know, it can be something that's run on incredibly teeny devices. Uh, Mark, just one quick question. Sure. Um, so I ran my little TypeScript experiment, and it told me that my main use of functions outside the Jesse function is string.join, or array.join, I should say. Say that's that again? That's the only thing not in YBest that I'm using extensively. OK, say, say it again. OK, so in uh, the current Jessica implementation, okay. uh, it's all written in Jesse, and the functions that I'm using outside of Jesse are array.join. Okay. Do we get that added, or should I write something else? Oh, 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 array.join is not on the Jesse whitelist? Yes. Uh, array.join, I'm happy to add it to the Jesse whitelist. Okay, thank you. Yep. And everything else looks okay. Great, 
Great. Yeah, I defined the Jesse whitelist um, as a rather small subset of the SES whitelist. Um, uh, so uh, when it pinches, uh, let me know and, you know, moderate extensions of it. Uh, the main criteria is that anything that's hard to implement, if you're implementing a simple eval apply interpreter in some foreign language, um, uh, if we can avoid adding it to the whitelist, I want to avoid adding it to the whitelist. Uh, that's, al that's also, by the way, why I've left out generators and async functions, is that if you're implementing a simple eval apply interpreter in a completely foreign language, uh, uh, you have a much higher burden to implement generators or async functions correctly. Okay, sounds good. So there are no promises, right? Generally. Uh, 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 Jesse does contain promises. Um, do you construct them with the new or, or how promise? So, yeah, we, 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 the, um, going back to uh, the points Michael was making earlier, it would be a make promise function that we would provide as part of the, uh, you know, the, the, the standard library for doing these things. Uh, where what make promise does is essentially call new promise, but then harden the result. Yeah, it makes sense. Right. How does that apply to promise.resolve and promise.reject that produce a already generated one that you can then chain off of? Uh, that's fine. That should all just work. All it means is to harden the promise is that uh, the promise does not have any meaningful instance properties anyway, um, but what, with, with promises as they come naturally, one could, for you know, if I give a promise out to both Bob and Carol, Bob could install a this function uh, as an own property on the promise which then confuses Carol. Um, if the primordials are frozen and the promise instances are frozen, uh, then uh, that kind of shadowing attack becomes impossible. But all the, all the normal functionality of promises should remain. And I saw it, see in the chat, yes, promise.all definitely, uh, promise.all settled. Yeah, probably. Um, uh, it's, it's. Could, could we name it something else? <laughs> well, a actually, all settled, given the other choices of terminology for describing promise semantics, all settled, I believe, is actually the right term. The sad story of all of our naming choices. <laughs> well, no, we've got some really terrible naming choices, but I think this one. Well, no, yeah. Well, let me let me turn it around. Uh, what do you suggest instead? Um, I just think that I keep looking up the spec every time I want to remember what it did. And that's not intuitive. Okay, so uh, so one possibility is to just omit all settled. Uh, I I've I only find myself um, even in E where I did have the equivalent both of promise dot all and promise dot all settled under completely different names, of course. Um, uh, but even when I had both of them available. I only ever found myself using the equivalent of promise.all. I just never needed promise.all settled. So, you know, basically promise.all and promise.race were the two things that I find myself using. And both of those are whitelisted. No, I mean, we can keep it with the same name. I was just hoping that, you know, if we can influence that somewhere, you know, maybe we should try, but. Um, if all settled is part of a language eventually, then I think we should have it if it doesn't, you know, violate. Um, yeah. 
so let me explain the, 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 the settled terminology because it's, it was actually a subtle matter that we got where, where in, in the terminology as I brought it over from E, I was missing a distinction. And I was missing a distinction in a way that made it easy to make simple statements that, that seemed intuitive but were actually wrong. And that's the difference between what we're now calling resolved versus what we're now calling settled. So if you, um, uh, if you, if you take a, 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 the resolver for a promise and you say uh, resolve to three, then the promise is resolved and the promise is also settled. Uh, if you, uh, uh, you know, take the resolver and you resolve it to a rejected promise, then the pro they reject then you make the promise itself rejected, um, in which case again the promise is both resolved and settled. Um, uh, so basically a promise is um, uh, resolved once you've invoked the resolver on it or done something equivalent to invoking the resolver on it. And a promise is settled when it is either fulfilled or rejected. So the case that makes these two things different is when we have unresolved promises P and Q, and then we resolve P to be Q. P is now resolved because its resolver is used up, but it is not settled until Q is settled. So, so um, you know, um, getting into very fine grain terminology, um, a promise is unsettled until it's either resolved or rejected. Until, it's, until, it's until, settled, until it's either fulfilled or rejected. Ah, uh, okay. So, so where does resolve not fit in that statement? Like, like, because you can, you can, so, so uh, actually, sorry, what I was trying to say is fulfilled or settled can be, um, can be uh, irrespective of state, of, of, of the, um, you know, the fact that it was resolved or rejected. Now, if you have, um, if it's fulfilled, then if you do a then on it, the first callback of the then gets invoked. If the promise is rejected and you do a mm -hmm. then on it, then the second callback of the then will be invoked. So if a promise is settled, then since it's either fulfilled or rejected, one of those two will be invoked. Now, if a promise P is resolved to promise Q, where promise Q is unresolved, then promise P is resolved in that its uh, resolver is used up. So, um, so the, the key thing about the terminology is we talk about the res whether it's resolved or not from the point of view of someone holding the resolver. Someone who's just holding the promise cannot observe whether a promise is resolved or not. Uh, all they can observe is the transition from unsettled to either fulfilled or rejected. Um, it's, uh, so if, if you resolve P to be the same as Q, you use up the P resolver. So, the, so you have to ha find a way to describe that stateful nature of the P resolver. Um, uh, and that's what we use the term resolve for which fits calling the object a resolver. Um, uh, but, a, it, but if you do that, and then you do a dot then on P, neither callback will be called until Q becomes settled. I, I really have to do a lot of reading there. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so um, like I, I always thought of resolved as 
the antonym uh, for rejected. No, that's f fulfilled is the antonym for, for rejected. Yeah, I think uh, TypeScript um, annotates this, um, annotates something with the word outfill or something like that. And, you know, um, so I just stuck to whatever I knew. Okay. Um, but now fulfilled, that, that, that really helps um, yeah. there, bring the clarity there. Yeah, one thing that I really reject, uh, one thing that I really regret is the original E terminology is that a promise uh, uh, becomes either fulfilled or broken. And that fits with the natural language usage of the term promise really well. Is the final state of a promise is, well, the promise got fulfilled or the promise got broken. Um, then when Tyler Close redid a lot of the E and promise concepts in Waterkin. He was doing it with the Java language base. And the problem with calling the state broken is the natural name for the verb is break. And break is a keyword. So that is the really awful reason why the promise broken terminology became the promise rejected terminology. Uh, and I just wish we had not conceded that because talking about broken promises is just so much easier to, to, to stimulate the right intuitions. We're a little bit over time, but I had one quick question for you too, Mark. Okay. Um, so the only other two instances I found where I might want to expand the whitelist or else learn a better way of doing things is promise.catch. I have and, no I have no objection to promise.catch. Okay. And array.isArray. Array array. Let me think about that for a moment. No objection. Both okay. of those are fine. Okay, and uh, so Michael, uh, you are now the steward of the Jesse whitelist. Okay, you got it. <laughs> I'll submit a PR. Okay, good. Thanks, I have to go now. Okay, uh, is now a good time to adjourn? Anybody else have anything they want to talk about? Okay, I propose we adjourn. See you guys, this was, this was a good you. session. Thank yep. you, everybody. Thank you.